One thing I wanted to kind of go over was the practicalities of fitting current voltage data. The form of the data looks something like this, where we're looking at voltage versus current density, and you know, you'll get a bunch of curves. And what you might be looking for is, you know, what is the temperature dependence? Because we know we're going to have temperature gradients. As you increase the temperature, your cell characteristics might change like this. And the form of the data is, you know, a bunch of data points. And we want to fit that to a data, to a model of some kind. There might also be studies versus gas concentration. If you can find that, that's great too. That's even better. And you can actually fit parameters that involve gas concentration. So a couple of tricks um, that I'll just mention. One is that if you were, were modeling this just empirically, you typically will use like a Butler-Volmer expression for the anode and cathode kinetics. So to remind you what that looks like, an exchange current density. Alpha F and alpha B are the forward and backward transfer coefficients for the reaction. Eta is the overpotential. F and R and T are the normal meaning. Part of the problem with this type of expression, it has a forward and a backward rate. Unless somebody actually went to the trouble of measuring the backward rate, we have almost no information on which to base a backward transfer coefficient. So a common thing to do is either suppress the backward rate altogether, just say that it's one. Another common thing to do would be just to assume the forward and backward transfer coefficients are the same and just call it alpha. Alpha is on the order of unity. So it might be like 0.5, something like that, usually a fraction of one. Is that totally true? No. But is it reasonable for purposes of our modeling? Yeah, because it's only going to be sensitive to the forward rate anyway, for the most part. If we do that, then this simplifies, which is just the cinch, cinch function. And what's great about that is we can invert this. So now we have a way of re-expressing eta versus i. So now we have a closed form equation for uh, eta versus i. And that's really convenient because now I can write V is V equilibrium minus electrolyte resistance minus a cathode over potential, which is a function of current density, and an anode over potential, which is a function of current density. So now if I have voltage versus current, I can fit that data to this model in this form, in a closed form. So I basically take all the current points, calculate eta um, for the cathode and anode, I calculate the ohmic resistance directly from the equilibrium voltage, and I get a voltage. And then we adjust the parameters until the voltages match the data. One thing we do want to include is, is temperature and composition dependencies. That's one of the things we're trying to fit. And so we need to build into our model temperature dependencies and concentration dependencies. Typically, exchange current densities that you have like in a, in a kinetic rate expression like the or volmer equation behave in an activated way. So we can say that I0 for either the anode or the cathode, this would be some value that it would have at an under standard temperature conditions. And then we write this uh, as an activated reaction. So we have some reference temperature T1, where we know the exchange current density, and we can write variations in the exchange current density as we change the temperature according to an Arrhenius expression. Ionic conductivity of the electrolyte typically does the same thing. And if we translate that to electrolyte resistance, this would give us a positive activation. And so parameters that would suddenly become part of our model would be the activation energy, the values of our resistance at standard, at standard temperature conditions, the exchange current density at a particular temperature, uh, and then we would adjust those parameters. Gas concentration, that doesn't affect the electrolyte, but the exchange current densities can depend on concentration. They typically do. Exchange current density, would typically scale in some way with the reactant and product concentrations with some power law. Not too different from 
reaction kinetics, although exchange current densities tend to have fractional order coefficients. It's not, it's not just the number of molecules that appear in the reaction statement. It's, it actually is more complicated than that. So you typically have weaker concentration dependencies in the exchange current density. Um, so for example, if we're looking, talking about the cathode, I'm adding subscripts. So I have several types of standards. I have the temperature standard, which is the one, and then I've got another zero, second zero. That second zero is a, is a reference state for the concentration. So this might be like PO2 to the one half power or at the anode. These coefficients um, can be parameters too. If, we, if you have the data, someone's run this experiment as a function of gas concentration, then you have a basis for possibly fitting those parameters. But even if you don't have that data, it's usually good to assume such, some type of dependence. You know, if you fit, if possible, but if not, it's better to assume something logical anyway. And part of the reason for this is we want the exchange current density to go to zero as the gas concentration goes to zero. This becomes important if you're simulating things at high utilization where gas concentrations start to become very low, then you want the, you want the model to predict that the current density will drop off uh, as the concentration of the reactants goes to zero. So with that, what we end up with our coefficients for the exchange current density, those things are going to be con are going to be parameters. We'll have activation energies, we'll, which will be parameters. Um, we have to know something about the gas composition in order to uh, use those parameters. But assuming we have all that, then we can put this into our into our voltage statement, and then fit that to the data. Okay, what I want to switch to now is just one procedure for doing that which I've worked up in Excel as an example. So here's the data. This is a cell that was produced probably 15 years ago by Cirrus Power and they released some of their data. The cell is particularly designed to operate at intermediate temperatures. So 800 C is kind of like an upper maximum. It can operate down as low as 500 C. And what I've done is I've done my best here to read the graph, pick out each data point, put it into Excel, in some cases interpolating between data points. And then I'm, I've plotted that. So squares, circles, diamonds, in this case, refer to three different temperatures at 700, 750, and 800 degrees where they did this measurement. And then these lines here, here, and here, those are plots of the model. I've thrown in some parameters. And um, I've made several assumptions here. Uh, one is I didn't know from the paper what the gas concentration was, it just said, humidified hydrogen going into this reaction. So how humidified was it? Um, so one thing you'll notice is that the open circuit voltage that I have in the model is not the same as the open circuit voltage they seem to measure in their experiment. Part of that could be that the gas composition I've assumed is different from the one that they actually had prevailing in their experiment. Basically that's what this section is down here. I'm taking the temperatures that they measured 7, 750, 800, taken delta G zero for hydrogen in this case, and I've used that to calculate the equilibrium cell potential uh, as a function of gas concentration. Sorry, this is the water concentration, this is the hydrogen concentration, which is 99.5%. And so as I adjust this up and down, like if this is 1%, that gives us a little bit lower open circuit voltage. If I make it 2%, a little bit lower, and so forth. So, so clearly they were operating with two or 3% water, something like that. And since some of my parameters here depend on concentration, I've gone ahead and I've set up a little um, optimization. So I've taken the actual cell voltages that they measured, and um, I'm, a, I'm assuming that every experiment had the same level of humidity. I'm taking the equilibrium voltage that I'm calculating at this concentration. I'm taking the difference between them, and I'm squaring that. And then I'm taking all of the deviations from all the data, and I'm adding it together. So this is the sum of square difference. And I'm, I'm forcing goal seek to take this least this square difference, force it to the lowest possible value as a function of the gas concentration. Uh, I'm actually gonna use solver. So I'm gonna set this to a minimum by varying that. 
Okay, that's a bit better. Okay, so 4.3% water. Okay, so once I have that, that concentration, now I can sort of proceed and sort of, well, okay, I can think about the other parameters that are in the kinetic model and are kind of affecting the kinetics. And so that's what this is. So here's, here's the data. Here's our model for the data. So I took the same current points from zero to 1.6 amps per square centimeter. And I'm calculating um, the voltage as the equilibrium voltage minus all the over potentials. And so it looks like a big mess because I've taken the formula and I've re-expressed it in Excel E's with cell references instead of uh, you know variables. And the model that I'm using over here is on the left is just sort of a summary of exactly what I was describing earlier on the board. The main main parameters in here, there's a reference temperature T1. So I'm taking that to be the reference temperature for all the parameters. R, RE1, that's the electrolyte resistance at 1,000 Kelvin. AE, AA, and AC, I didn't want to use E, so I used A. These are the activation energies for the electrolyte, the anode, and then the cathode. Then we have an exchange current density at the nominal concentration for the anode. I'm assuming here that actually the anode is not very resistant at these temperatures, which is usually true in an SOFC. It's usually the cathode. So I've just set the anode exchange current density at a big number, like 100 amps per square centimeter. That basically means the anode is not a very important thing until we get to very low gas concentrations. The alpha parameter for both the anode and cathode, I've just assumed is a half because I don't have any data. And then the cathode uh, exchange current density, that's the one that I'm actually going to be adjusting. This, is, this sets the magnitude of the resistance of the cathode. And then I have an activation energy for the cathode, which is going to be what adjusts the temperature dependency of that resistance. So putting all that together, the things I want to adjust here, the cathode activation energy, the cathode exchange current density, the activation energy for the electrolyte, and the electrolyte resistance. And so what I've set up, got your data, which shows, you know, as a function of current, what the voltage is at different conditions. I'm just going to reproduce that over here as a model. I just create another table which has the same points, but the model prediction. And then the third table over here I've just set up is the difference between those two. So again, I'm going to use a least squares approach. So I take the difference between the measured and the, and the calculated value and square that, right? So now it's a positive number. I then take all of the differences for all the points in a single temperature and add them together. And then for all the different temperatures, I take those and I add them together. So the result of that is I end up with a single objective function for the entire model. So the fact that I have multiple curves and I'm varying as a function of temperature, maybe I have gas, gas concentration varying too. That doesn't matter because I have parameters in there that can handle, in this case, the temperature dependency. And I'm, I'm allowing those to adjust as I compare all the data at all the temperatures. So in this case, I am solving, my objective is this total overall objective function. Um, I'm gonna minimize it. And I'm gonna do that by adjusting all of the, all the parameters that I care about. And in this case, I'm adjusting the resistance of the cathode and the electrolyte and their two activation energies, those four parameters. And then we hit go. Hopefully this works. Yeah, pretty good. Now we have our model. It's not perfect, but it does capture the basic trends that we're seeing in the data. So I have some confidence that this would be mildly extrapolatable to, to temperatures that are outside of our range um, and roughly correctly break down the electrode and electrolyte contributions in this case.